A pilot initiates a missed approach. The airplane suddenly rolls and impacts the ground in a 17 degree, nose down pitch attitude. An airplane on approach experiences pitch excursions of greater than 70 degrees. The airplane does not recover. An airplane is on an automatic ILS approach, but an error has been made with the autoflight system. The airplane enters a severe nose-high pitch attitude, stalls, and does not recover. Three different accidents, three different causes, but one common thread. At some point in each case, the airplane was upset and entered an unusual attitude. That is, the plane unintentionally exceeded the parameters that you, the pilot, normally experience in day-to-day -day operations. Every day around the world, tens of thousands of airplanes take flight. As you well know, an overwhelming majority of those flights proceed without incident. Airplane upsets are not a common occurrence. However, there have been many loss-of-control incidents in multi-engine turbojet airplanes. And, since the beginning of the jet age, there have been a significant number of commercial jet transport accidents attributed to control problems. As you'll see, causes for airplane upsets are varied, and in some cases, difficult to agree upon. But one thing everyone agrees with is that once your airplane is upset and enters an unusual attitude, you may have little time to react. The actions you take are critical to recovery. With this in mind, airlines, pilot associations, airplane manufacturers, and government aviation and regulatory agencies feel it is appropriate that you receive airplane upset recovery training. This video will define airplane upset, will look at causes, and will review aerodynamic principles that form a basis for recovery. There's no doubt. You never want to be in a situation where your airplane has rolled or pitched out of control. But if you do find yourself in such a situation, the information that follows can play a vital part in a successful recovery. An airplane is defined as upset if it unintentionally exceeds the parameters normally experienced in line operations or training. Specific values may vary among airplane models, but the following conditions are generally agreed upon. Unintentional pitch attitude greater than 25 degrees nose up. Unintentional pitch attitude greater than 10 degrees nose down. Unintentional bank angle greater than 45 degrees. Or, even within these parameters, but flying at air speeds inappropriate for the conditions. The causes of airplane upset are varied, but these can also be broadly categorized. Upsets that are environmentally induced, those caused by airplane components, those caused by human factors, or those induced by a combination of any of these. Interpreting and responding to rapidly changing environmental conditions is a constant way of life for the working pilot. These conditions can also lead to an airplane upset, although not all of them have a direct effect on the airplane itself. For example, a rapid environmental change may dictate a quick transition from VMC to IMC. During this transition, it's often easy to get distracted. Research shows that an upset is more likely to develop when the flight crew is distracted. Environmental conditions can also cause visual illusions, such as false vertical and horizontal cues. During such illusions, instruments can be misinterpreted, and again, the flight crew can be distracted. 
The biggest danger from environmental conditions, however, are those that directly affect the airplane flight path, such as the various types of turbulence a pilot might encounter. Industry study has validated that wake vortex turbulence can contribute to an airplane upset. Wind shear has also been extensively studied and is a known cause of upset. Mountain waves. Severe turbulence advancing up one side of a mountain and down the other is another environmental factor that can affect the airplane flight path. As is clear air turbulence, often marked by rapid changes in pressure, temperature fluctuations, and dramatic changes in wind direction and velocity. Other environmentally induced factors that can contribute to or cause an airplane upset include thunderstorms and weather conditions that result in ice buildup on the airplane. The best solution to environmental hazards is to avoid them when possible. Mockton Center Atlantic 250 requesting 20 degree deviation to the left for weather. Today's airplanes are remarkably reliable, and malfunction of components or equipment that can lead to an upset are rare. Because of this high level of reliability, when these problems do occur, they can surprise the flight crew. Airplane component problems, such as an instrument failure or an autopilot failure, fall under this category. Again, the result can be direct, such as an autopilot failure resulting in a pitch moment, or there can be an indirect effect if the flight crew has been significantly distracted by the failure of a particular component. Other causes include flight control anomalies and system failures that lead to unusual control input requirements, as might be experienced with an engine failure, failure of the yaw damper, the spoilers, the flaps or slats, the primary flight controls, or as a result of structural problems. Human factors must also be taken into account when examining possible causes. Cross-check and instrument interpretation is an example. Misinterpretation of instruments or a slow cross-check may lead to an upset. You're cleared to three. Okay, starting down. An upset can result from unexpected airplane response to power adjustments, automated functions, or control inputs. Inappropriate use of automation or by pilots applying opposing inputs simultaneously. Hey, check your speed. The autopilot's not holding airspeed very good. You're in vertical speed mode. Okay, I forgot. Go on flight level change, 240. As previously mentioned, inattention or distraction in the flight deck can lead to an upset. This includes any type of distraction that causes the flight crew to disregard control of the airplane, even momentarily. Spatial disorientation, the inability to correctly orient oneself with respect to the Earth's surface, has been a significant factor in many airplane upsets. Other rare but possible human factors include pilot incapacitation due to a medical problem, or even rarer, a hijacking situation. A combination of any of these factors can also lead to upset. It's important to remember that we're trying to look at all possible causes here, no matter how remote the possibility. The fact is, it's sometimes this very remoteness that allows an upset situation to develop. Now that we've taken a look at the possible causes, let's take a few moments to review some key aerodynamic principles. These are the things you learned at the beginning of your flying career. You now react instinctively on the flight deck and rarely need to think about aerodynamic theory. However, in an airplane upset situation, these principles form the basis for recovery. We've asked the chief test pilots for Boeing and Airbus to assist us in this discussion. These are pilots who have taken their airplanes to the extremes. When discussing large airplane aerodynamics, Three words often enter the conversation. Energy, the capacity to do work. 
flight path, the actual direction and velocity an airplane follows, and maneuver, a controlled variation of the flight path. In an airplane, the ultimate goal of using energy is to maneuver the airplane to control the flight path. The energy created by the thrust of the engines and the lift generated by the wings is controlled by the thrust levers and flight controls to overcome gravity and aerodynamic drag. In other words, flight controls give you the ability to balance the forces acting on the airplane in order to maneuver, to change the flight path of the airplane. The direction of the lift produced by the wings is independent of the direction of gravity. Two other important principles, energy management and angle of attack. An airplane in flight has two types of energy, kinetic or airspeed and potential or altitude. You exchange speed for altitude and altitude for speed. The angle at which the wing meets the relative wind is called the angle of attack. Angle of attack does not equate to pitch angle. Changing the angle of attack either increases or decreases the amount of lift generated. But beyond the stall, the angle of attack must be reduced to restore lift. Now let's look at the elements of stability. Movement around the lateral axis of an airplane is called pitch and is usually controlled by the elevator. At any specific combination of airplane configuration, weight, center of gravity, and speed, there will be one elevator position in which all of these forces are balanced. In flight, the two elements most easily changed are speed and elevator position. As the speed changes, the elevator position must be adjusted to balance the aerodynamic forces. For example, as the speed increases, the wing creates more lift. If the airplane is at a balanced in-trim position in flight, it will generally seek to return to the trim position if upset by external forces or momentary pilot input. This is called positive longitudinal static stability. We've all experienced this and are familiar with the requirements to apply pull forces when an airplane is slowed and push forces when an airplane speeds up. Changes in airplane configuration will also affect pitching moment. For example, extending wing-mounted speed brakes generally produces a nose-up pitching moment. Airplanes that have electronic flight control systems, commonly referred to as fly-by-wire, may automatically compensate for these changes in configuration. Thrust affects pitch as well. With underwing engines, reducing thrust creates a nose-down pitching moment. Increasing thrust creates a nose-up pitching moment. Airplanes with fuselage or tail-mounted engines, or those designed with electronic flight controls, produce different effects. Whatever type of plane you are flying, you need to know how the airplane will respond. The combination of elevator and stabilizer position also affects pitch. In normal maneuvering, the pilot displaces the elevator to achieve a change in pitch. The stabilizer is then trimmed by driving it to a new position to balance the forces. This new stabilizer position is fared with the elevator. If the stabilizer and elevator are not fared, one cancels out the other. This condition limits the airplane's ability to overcome other pitching moments from configuration changes or thrust. Now, let's continue this discussion by taking a look at yaw and roll. Motion about the vertical axis is called yaw and is controlled by the rudder. Movement of the rudder creates a force and a resulting rotation about the vertical axis. The vertical stabilizer and rudder are sized to meet two objectives. To control asymmetric thrust from an engine failure at the most demanding flight condition and to generate sufficient side slip for crosswind landings. To achieve these objectives at takeoff and landing speeds, the vertical stabilizer and rudder must be capable of generating powerful yawing moments and large side slip angles. Motion about the longitudinal axis is called roll. 
Control inputs cause the ailerons, and then spoilers, to control the airplane's roll rate. The aileron and spoiler movement changes the local angle of attack of the wing, changing the amount of lift, which causes rotation about the longitudinal axis. During an upset, there may be unusually large amounts of aileron input required to recover the airplane. If necessary, this can be assisted by coordinated input of rudder in the direction of the desired roll. However, when a large transport swept wing airplane is at a high angle of attack, pilots must be careful when using rudder for assisting lateral control. Excessive rudder can cause excessive side slip, which could lead to departure from controlled flight. As angle of attack increases, aileron and spoiler effectiveness decrease because the airflow begins to separate over the wing. However, the rudder airflow is not separated. It remains aerodynamically effective. In some aircraft configurations, there is a certain crossover speed at which full aileron and spoiler deflection is necessary to counter the roll due to full rudder deflection and the resulting side slip. Below this crossover speed, the rolling moment created by ailerons and spoilers is gradually unable to counter the rolling moment induced by the side slip generated by full rudder deflection. The airplane must be unloaded to reduce angle of attack and the airspeed must be increased to maintain lateral control. In contrast, very high speeds in excess of VMO and MMO cause control surfaces to be blown down, rendering them less effective. The main concern at high speed in excess of VMO and MMO comes from vibrations and high air loads that may lead to structural damage. Other effects often include reduced effectiveness or even reversal of control response. Any pitching moment due to speed brake extension or retraction is more pronounced at high speed and pitching effects as a result of thrust changes are less pronounced. High speed buffet is caused by shockwave instability. As the airplane exceeds its cruise speed, the shockwave that runs along the wing upper surface becomes strong enough to cause the beginning of a local separation or stall. This causes the flow over the wing to fluctuate, leading to rapid changes in drag and the position of the center of pressure. The ensuing buffet results in a loss of aerodynamic efficiency of the wing, which will impact the high speed dive recovery. The buffet can be disconcerting and will normally not be symmetrical on each wing, resulting in a rocking motion during a pull-up. The pilot should relax the pull force if high-speed buffet is encountered. Altitude and Mach also affect the performance of the control surfaces. The higher the altitude and Mach, the more sensitive the airplane is to control surface movements, making the recovery more difficult. Asymmetric thrust affects roll. When there is asymmetric thrust, side slip is created and thus roll. This is normally countered with rudder and lateral control. Obviously then, reducing an asymmetric thrust condition will also reduce the side slip associated with it. The definition of VMCA is the minimum flight speed at which the airplane is controllable with a maximum of five degrees bank when the critical engine suddenly becomes inoperative with the remaining engine at takeoff thrust. Below this speed, there is insufficient directional control. As the airspeed decreases, the ability to maneuver the airplane also decreases. During a full or deep stall, the flight controls become less effective because of the high angle of attack. However, the rudder remains effective at lower speeds. This can be good or bad. At speeds above stall, the rudder can assist the airplane's ability to roll. But at slower speeds, there will be a delay after application of the rudder before roll response becomes apparent to you. Also, the amount of rudder used and the rate at which it is applied is critical. The bad part is that at speeds approaching the stall speed, or speeds below the stall speed, use of rudder applied too quickly or held too long may result in loss of lateral and directional control and cause structural damage. 
At any speed, large aggressive flight control reversals can lead to loads that can exceed structural design limits. Another consideration for longitudinal control is G-load. That is, the amount of load factor that is aligned with the vertical axis of the aircraft. In a level turn, or pull-up, the wing has to create more lift and the pilot feels more G-load. The increased G-load will also increase the stalling speed. Generally, the elevator and stabilizer have sufficient control authority to drive the wing past its stalling angle of attack, even at high speed, which can adversely affect pitch and roll control. This means that the wing can be stalled. In this case, regardless of the pitch attitude, a pilot cannot command a specific bank angle or flight path even at high air speeds. The aircraft has entered into an accelerated stall. The wing loading must be reduced to recover from this stall and regain pitch and roll control. Aircraft with electronic flight control systems may provide protection against entering into many upset situations. These systems also assist the aircraft to return to normal flight if necessary. However, when fly-by-wire aircraft operate in the degraded mode, flight control inputs and the responses are similar to non-fly-by-wire aircraft. The aerodynamic principles we've reviewed are applied to airplane design. During flight testing, all airplane manufacturers exceed these parameters to help prove the safety of the airplanes you eventually fly. A working knowledge of these principles is vital to a successful recovery from an upset situation. In this video, we've defined what an airplane upset is. We've looked at causes, and we've reviewed the aerodynamics associated with recovery. We've laid a foundation. To build upon this foundation, follow-on training should review specific recovery techniques. Different accidents, different causes, but all of these accidents do have one thing in common. At some time during the flight, an airplane upset occurred, and there's one other critical thing they have in common. The flight crews did not recover. An airplane is defined as upset if it unintentionally exceeds the parameters normally experienced in line operations or training. Specific values may vary among airplane models, but the following conditions are generally agreed upon. Unintentional pitch attitude greater than 25 degrees nose up. Unintentional pitch attitude greater than 10 degrees nose down. Unintentional bank angle greater than 45 degrees, or even within these parameters, but flying at air speeds inappropriate for the conditions. Airplane upsets do happen, but they are rare. Because of this rarity, a flight crew that finds itself in an upset situation can quickly be overwhelmed. Causes of upsets vary. They may be caused by environmental factors, by component or equipment malfunction, by human factors, or by a combination of any of these. But no matter the cause, the foundation for recovery is the same. You must recognize and confirm the situation, Disengage the autopilot and autothrottle. Use whatever authority is required of the flight controls. And you must maneuver the airplane to return to normal bank and pitch. Once you've entered an upset condition, you probably won't be able to rely on outside visual references. In many cases, you won't be able to locate the horizon. You must plan on interpreting your instruments. And if you are unsure if an instrument is working, such as your attitude indicator, you must confirm your situation through multiple sources. In fact, that's one of the reasons why redundancy of critical instrumentation is built into an airplane. This video will examine specific recovery techniques that you can use once your airplane has been upset. We've asked three pilots to help us in this discussion. Three pilots who've actually been in some of the situations we'll be looking at. 
The chief test pilots for Boeing and Airbus have a great deal of expertise when it comes to airplanes that fly outside the normal regime. During flight testing, they regularly push their airplanes beyond normal flight parameters. For the purposes of this training, it doesn't matter how or why the airplane entered an upset situation or what caused it. What matters most is that you understand that your reaction time is limited. In short, if you find yourself in an upset situation, you must act, and you must act quickly and correctly. You must also guard against letting the recovery of one airplane upset lead into a different upset situation. An upset recovery team comprised of representatives from airlines, pilot associations, airplane manufacturers, and government aviation and regulatory agencies developed the techniques presented here. These techniques are not necessarily procedural. Use of both primary and secondary flight controls to affect the recovery from an unusual attitude are discussed. Your air carrier must address procedural application within your own fleet structure. The upset recovery team strongly recommends that your procedures for initial recovery emphasize using primary flight controls, aileron, elevator, and rudder. However, the application of secondary flight controls, stab trim, thrust vector effects, and speed brakes may be considered incrementally to supplement primary flight control inputs after the recovery has been initiated. One more thing. The recovery techniques we'll discuss Assume that the airplane is not stalled. If it is stalled, it is necessary to first recover from the stall condition before initiating these techniques. At this point, we feel it is important to discuss stall recovery. As a pilot, you hear and use a lot of different terminology when discussing stalls. Stall warning, stick shaker, deep stalls, and approach to stalls. These are all used in daily conversation. As we said, in some upset situations, you must first recover from a stall before applying any other recovery actions. Now what do we mean by that? By stall, we mean an angle of attack beyond the stalling angle. A stall is characterized by any or a combination of the following. Buffeting, which could be heavy. The lack of pitch authority. The lack of roll control inability to arrest descent rate. These characteristics are usually accompanied by a continuous stall warning. A stall must not be confused with a stall warning that occurs before the stall and warns of an approaching stall. You have been trained to recover from an approach to stall which is not the same as a recovery from a stall. An approach to stall is a controlled flight maneuver However, a full stall is an out-of-control condition, but it is recoverable. To recover from the stall, angle of attack must be reduced below the stalling angle. You must apply nose-down pitch control and maintain it until you have recovered from the stall. Under certain conditions, on airplanes with underwing mounted engines, you may have to reduce thrust in order to prevent the angle of attack from continuing to increase. Once unstalled, continue with the other recovery actions and reapply thrust as needed. Airplanes that are designed with electronic flight control systems, commonly referred to as fly-by-wire airplanes, have safety features that should preclude the airplane from entering into an upset and assist the pilot in recovery if it becomes necessary. However, when fly-by-wire airplanes are in the degraded flight control mode, the recovery techniques and aerodynamic principles we will discuss are appropriate. Imagine a wings level situation where the airplane pitch attitude is unintentionally more than 25 degrees nose high and increasing. In this case, the airspeed is decreasing rapidly. As the airspeed decreases, the ability to maneuver the airplane also decreases. Recognize and confirm the situation. Start by disengaging the autopilot and auto throttle. Next, apply nose-down elevator to achieve a nose-down pitch rate. 
This may require as much as full nose down input. If a sustained column force is required to obtain desired response, you may consider trimming off some of the control force. However, it may be difficult to know how much trim should be used. Therefore, care must be taken to avoid using too much trim. Do not fly the airplane using pitch trim and stop trimming nose down as the required elevator force lessens. If at this point you cannot immediately get the pitch rate under control, there are several additional techniques which may be tried. The use of these techniques depends on the circumstances of the situation and the airplane control characteristics. You may also control the pitch by rolling the airplane to a bank angle which starts the nose down, normally not to exceed approximately 60 degrees. Maintaining continuous nose down elevator pressure will keep the wing angle of attack as low as possible, making the normal roll controls as effective as possible. With airspeed as low as stick shaker onset, normal roll controls up to full deflection of the ailerons and spoilers can be used. The rolling maneuver changes the pitch rate into a turning maneuver, allowing the pitch to decrease. In most situations, the steps we've just outlined should be enough to recover. Other techniques may also be employed to achieve a nose-down pitch rate. If altitude permits, flight tests have shown that an effective method to get a nose-down pitch rate is to reduce the power on underwing-mounted engines. This will reduce the upward pitch moment. If the control provided by the ailerons and spotters is ineffective, rudder input may be required to induce a rolling maneuver for recovery. Only a small amount of rudder is needed. Too much rudder applied too quickly or held too long may result in loss of lateral and directional control. Because of the low energy condition, use caution when applying rudder. To complete the recovery, roll to wings level as the nose approaches the horizon. Recover to a slightly nose low attitude, check airspeed, and adjust thrust and pitch as necessary. Now imagine an upset situation where the airplane pitch attitude is unintentionally more than 10 degrees nose low. Recognize and confirm the situation. In a nose low, low speed situation, remember that the aircraft may be stalled at a relatively low pitch and it is necessary to recover from the stall first. This may require nose down elevator, which may not be intuitive. Once recovered from the stall, apply thrust. The nose must be returned to the desired pitch, avoiding a secondary stall, as indicated by stall warning or buffet. Respect the airplane limitations of G-forces and airspeed.
In a nose low, high speed situation, apply nose up elevator. Then it may be necessary to cautiously apply stabilizer trim to assist obtaining the desired nose up pitch rate. Reduce thrust and if required, extend speed brakes. Complete the recovery by establishing a pitch, thrust and configuration that corresponds to the desired airspeed. A question naturally arises. How hard do I pull? Here are some considerations. Obviously, you must avoid impacting the terrain. But also, avoid entering into an accelerated stall. And respect the aircraft's limitations of G-forces and airspeed. We've defined a high bank angle for upset as more than 45 degrees. However, it is possible to experience bank angles greater than 90 degrees. In high bank angle situations, the primary objective is to roll in the shortest direction to near wings level. But if the airplane is stalled, you must first recover from the stall. Recognize and confirm the situation. At high bank angles, you may be in a nose high attitude or a nose low attitude. Let's look at a nose-high situation first. A nose-high, high angle of bank attitude requires deliberate flight control inputs. A large bank angle is helpful in reducing excessively high pitch attitudes. Unload and adjust the bank angle to achieve a nose-down pitch rate while keeping energy management and airplane roll rate in mind. To complete the recovery, Roll to wings level as the nose approaches the horizon. Recover to a slightly nose low attitude, check airspeed, and adjust thrust and pitch as necessary. A nose low high angle of bank requires prompt action because altitude is rapidly being exchanged for airspeed. Even if the airplane is at an altitude where ground impact is not an immediate concern, Airspeed can rapidly increase beyond airplane design limits. Simultaneous application of roll and adjustment of thrust may be necessary. Again, disengage the autopilot and auto throttle. In this situation, it may be necessary to unload the airplane by decreasing back pressure or even pushing to obtain forward elevator pressure. Use full aileron and spoiler input if necessary to smoothly establish a recovery roll rate toward the nearest horizon. It is important to not increase g-force or use nose-up elevator or stabilizer until approaching wings level. If full lateral control application is not satisfactory, you may need to apply rudder in the direction of the desired roll. As the wings approach level, use the procedures we discussed earlier for a nose low situation. Adjust thrust and drag devices as required. As you've seen, there are specific recovery techniques that you can use if your airplane becomes upset. No matter the type of upset. Nose high, wings level. Nose low, wings level. High angle of bank. You must take control of the situation and you must react quickly and correctly. Let's review the nose high and nose low recoveries one more time, incorporating bank angles.
Remember, the sequence of application of these techniques will vary depending upon the specific situation encountered. Thorough review of the causes of airplane upsets and the recommended actions you should take will help prepare you to act quickly and decisively should an upset occur. From 1987 through 1996, the leading cause of air carrier hull loss was loss of control. It should be very beneficial to place more emphasis on aircraft maneuvering characteristics and unusual attitude recoveries in both transition and recurrent training. Hello, I'm Captain Warren Vandenberg and I would like to introduce you to the first in a series of video segments from the Advanced Aircraft Maneuvering Program. In this video, we'll review unusual attitude recovery procedures. Now what we're going to do is we're going to take uh, the body of knowledge that we have developed to this point and we're going to apply it to uh, procedures that we've developed at American Airlines to deal with unusual attitude or critical flight attitude recoveries. We have developed a procedure for nose low recoveries and a procedure for nose high recoveries. And we have found using those two procedures, you can deal with a myriad of bad things that can happen out, the, out there to you, as you'll see later today. But before we can get into those procedures, first we have to develop something we call situation awareness. All pilots understand that. that what we have to first know is what is it we are in so we know which procedure to apply to get out of it. And, uh, as we start to look at this issue, it became kind of interesting. As I worked through various fleets, uh, uh, watching again our mostly Czech airmen performing, you know, in those uh, various fleet issues, each of those critical flight attitude recovery software problems I was putting in there, I noticed something that a large percentage of our pilots had is kind of an airline pilot uh, uh, mentality, if you will. I would give them a perfectly clear day out there. You could see the whole planet in the simulator. And then I would upset them with some of this new software, and I noticed that they would immediately go right to the attitude indicator and work this problem as they sorted it on the attitude and I'd get that thing recovered, and they'd recover, and I'd go, hey, that was really great. Nice job. But did you ever think of looking outside? See? What I'm trying to suggest to you here is if you have a visible horizon, i.e., you can see the planet, use it. It is your best piece of essay you could ever have. Now, if you can't see the horizon, you know, it's hazy and you're in a fishbowl or something, you can only see straight down to the ground, or maybe you're pure IMC, now you're going to have to come to this. Now, the next thing I learned is I flew all the different fleet simulators that I had never really thought about before I started developing this program, is that these flat plate displays have got significant limitations in this arena. I had not thought much about that. See, in my other life, I did all of this on a ball attitude indicator. And the ball attitude indicator told me a lot about what was going on. But on a flat plate display, all you get is a little piece of the picture. And, and so we had to develop a means of getting situation awareness that would work across all of the fleets in American Airlines because I think everyone in this room clearly understands as you go from fleet to fleet to fleet, you don't want to have a different way of doing something that's a critical procedure every time. We want to train you every time you come down here to do this the same way, both get your SA and do the procedure. It should work on all fleet aircraft. And we have accomplished that, I believe. Now, you'll have to come with me on this because initially you may balk just slightly. Okay? So come along with me for a minute because you will see why we chose it to do it this way. What we're going to say is you have a three-step process to get your SA, and this applies on 7-2 Asaurus or our most modern, highly automated airplanes. The three steps are, first, you must locate the sky pointer. The sky pointer is this little white diamond with a hollow center. There's one of those on every American Airlines fleet aircraft, and you have to find it first. You'll see why in a minute. 
Second, we're going to say you need to determine your pitch attitude slant deck angle, i.e., relative to the fixed aircraft symbol, am I nose high or nose low? That'll determine the recovery procedure to be applied. And then lastly, you have to locate your horizon line. Well, that becomes another one of these flat plate display limitations. As you can see in this example, the horizon line is gone from view. So therefore, there has to be a 3A, which says, if there is no horizon, I will use my pitch ladder bar as the horizon reference because it is always parallel to. So one, two, three. Locate the sky pointer. Am I nose high or nose low relative to the fixed aircraft symbol? Where's my horizon line? If there isn't a horizon line, I will use the pitch ladder bar as my horizon reference. Now this yellow down here, confirm your attitude by reference to other indicators. What that's referring to is all the experienced pilots in this room, I'm sure, can imagine. If you're in your, your approach plates, you know, or something like that, and you look up and you see your attitude indicator in a really strange position, before you do something wild and crazy with the flight controls, be sure it's not just your attitude indicator. See? And, and I know you understand it. Now, that becomes fleet specific. In each fleet, there's a different other thing that you check for confirmation, and rightfully so. So you check here, and we'll brief you on those. OK. Now, let's go first and develop situation awareness. I will do recovery procedures in a minute. Right now, let's just develop SA. Let's look at the guy that's on this attitude indicator. What does he look like? Well, he's climbing. Not too tough. He can handle this. We're going to do another one now. I would ask you, if you wouldn't mind, announce out loud when I push this one up, what's the first thing we have to find? OK? Ready? Go. Yes, the sky pointer. And it is in what I call the zone. <laughs> it's in the oh, shoot zone. Guys and gals, the accident history in the airline business on this is horrible. Airline pilots finding themselves in this attitude have demonstrated a consistent penchant to put 1G on their airline butt. And if you put 1G on your butt right now, it will add to God's existing 1G. That becomes 2Gs. And this airplane is in a tight turn, and it's taking you somewhere you don't want to go. We must immediately recognize that our lift vector is pointed at the dirt. We'll talk about how to deal with that in a minute. Okay? We identify the fact that our lift vector is pointed at the dirt. In a minute, we will soon learn to associate our lift vector with our sky pointer. Okay, second thing we have to find. What is my pitch attitude relative to the fixed aircraft symbol? Nose high or nose low? Nose low. And lastly, where's my horizon line? Right there. I got everything I need to know. We'll do recoveries in a minute. Right now, just SA. What does this aircraft look like? Looks like that. You're about to be challenged to recover from a critical flight attitude. Let's do another one together. If you don't mind, out loud, when I flash it up, we'll go through the first three steps. What's the first thing we've got to find? Yeah, now that's not so bad, is it? I can live with that. OK, next thing. Rel yeah. Relative to the fixed aircraft symbol, I'm very nose high, aren't I? And then lastly, where's my horizon? It's gone, isn't it? So what am I going to use? Yep, I'll have to use the pitch ladder bar as my horizon reference for the recovery. Because it's always parallel to. All right, let's take a look at this guy. Now. Yeah. Folks on the left side here are probably getting excited. <laughs> on the other hand, the folks on the right are still reading their newspaper, aren't they? No clue. Okay, 
Let's do one more. And if you don't mind, once again, out loud together, what's the first thing we've got to find here? Oh, shoot. Next thing. Yeah, very low, isn't it? Very low relative to the fixed aircraft symbol. And then lastly, my horizon line. I got everything I need to know to recover now. We'll do recoveries in a second. What's he look like? This fellow is in deep kimchi if he's close to the ground because his nose is so low, right? He can get out of this, but he's got to get very aggressive with the flight controls, as we'll talk about in a minute. Okay. Now, having developed our situation awareness, we need to apply some procedures to that. As you know, these procedures are now in every American Airlines fleet manual. Our intention here today, though, is to, is to go through these procedures you have in your manual as pilot to pilot and, and, and talk about what does each of these bullets mean and how do we apply them. Before I start on these procedures that are in all of your manuals, there's something we need to get clear in this room between all of us. And that is that the first step on every procedure and in everything that we do today is not written on any slide. The reason I don't put it on all the slides is because it is always the same first step. Always. The first unseen, unwritten step says that when your airplane is departing its intended lateral or vertical path, the pilot flying will go click, 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 click. Autopilot and auto throttles off is always the first step. And I cannot overemphasize this point. As we look at the accident history out there, we see automation dependent pilots. With an airplane departing its intended lateral or vertical path, pushing buttons up here on an AFDS panel, or typing in typewriters down here. Not realizing that this plane has got a serious anomaly. And the, before they realize it, the airplane gets very close to the edge of their flight envelope while they're typing. Don't let that happen. Get a hold of it. When it's departing this intended lateral or vertical path, turn that stuff off. Find out what's going on here. Don't let it get that close to the edge of the envelope. Not to mention, you should see how interesting it is trying to recover from one of these with the autopilot on. Okay? Or even worse, the auto throttles. You should see what they can do to you. Okay? Okay, that's always the first step. Now, having completed the first step, then we're going to look at each of the bullets for the nose high recovery process. Before I do that, though, I have to identify this one, which is thrust, because it's in the number three position, and I've already had so many pilots ask this that I have to just cover it right up front. I know many pilots uh, were trained, and, and probably rightfully so at the time, that on a nose-high recovery, thrust comes first. In fact, the FAA Instrument Flying Handbook says, thrust comes first when your nose high. Well, now, how can I go against the FAA? See? Well, they're not wrong, but see, they wrote their book for a Cessna 172, which has a fan on the nose and a total inertial range of 40 knots. We have thrust vector effect and an inertial range of 400 knots. That does not work for us. I mean, as an example, if you had a plane built like this, and you found that airplane in this attitude, and the first thing you did was cob the power, what would happen? Sure, wow. Well, now which way is the nearest horizon? <laughs> Good news is you can't be wrong. <laughs> that doesn't work for us, okay? Not on our kind of airplane. So we're going to belay that, and we're, the first step is going to deal is going to deal with the issue. The issue being, let's get the nose stop rising and start lowering. It says we will unload and roll the airplane toward the nearest horizon to lower the nose while maintaining some positive g-force. Well, what does that mean? Well, first, unload. 
I think uh, most of the pilots in this room understand we got an airplane like this, right? There's a flight path vector, i.e. angle of attack. If we unload, what we're saying, as you know, is to ease the yoke forward. Unload your butt off the seat. In other words, move toward zero G. Maybe not go all the way. You might have people walking around back there. But move pretty close to zero. If we come off of one and move toward zero by pushing the yoke forward, what happens to this angle? It goes right in like that, doesn't it? When it goes right in like that, if you have no more alpha, you have no more lift. If you have no more lift, the nose stops rising. That's good. See? The other good thing is when you reduce alpha down to almost zero, you enable all control surfaces to work normally down to almost no speed. That's right. You can have 50 knots on this plane right now and all your control surfaces will respond normally because you've reduced alpha by unloading. The next thing then says, roll. Well, since you've unloaded, what are you going to roll with? Well, you're going to roll with ailerons and spoilers, aren't you? Rudder won't roll this plane at low angle of attack. Aileron and spoilers roll it. So we come in with aileron and spoilers, and we roll toward the nearest horizon. Now, if you're right wing low, roll right. Now, some of you out there might say, well, I'm going to use a little coordinated rudder to help the nose come down. Fine. That's fine. That's good technique. A little. OK. Smoothly applied. I mean, understand right here, if you jam full right rudder, that's the spin entry procedure. <laughs> so, so what we want is we're going to use roll controls here and then a little coordinated rudder, fine. Okay. All right, what have we just done? By taking that act, what we have done, by, by making that action, we have rolled the lift vector off. When you roll the lift vector off, your nose is coming down, period. No matter what's wrong with this plane, your nose is coming down. Guys and gals, there are four hull losses out there in five years where both crew members are pushing full forward and it was never going to solve the problem. Never, due to the control anomaly that existed at the time. You've got to roll the lift vector off in those situations to get the nose coming down. The second problem, or the second issue here is if you try to go straight ahead over the top, a, you may not have enough energy to make it because it is the long way. It's the long way over the top. The short way is to roll out of it. That's the short way out. It will preserve the most energy. If you don't have enough energy, if you just try to go straight forward over the top, if you don't have enough energy to make it, you will stall and fall. If you have enough energy to make it over the top, everyone in the back will be... Yeah. Yeah, they'll be getting one of those zero to negative G rides. So, roll. It's the shortest way out of the problem, and it will work no matter what's wrong. And this is a time critical event. We don't have a lot of time for analyzing what's wrong. We've got to keep this airplane under control. <clears throat> we got this next bullet that says normally limit bank angle to approximately 70 degrees. I hate a number. Whenever I put a number up, a pilot sees a target. So listen, that's not a target. It's kind of a limit. What am I saying there? Well, as I started doing this in, the, in, the, in our larger transport airplanes, I initially reverted to my other life. In my other life, you know, I just rolled to 90 degrees of bank and just came on down. Well, when I did that in the big transport simulators, I learned something kind of surprising. It shouldn't have been, but it was. As you come through the horizon to 90 degrees of bank on these big puppies, you don't have adequate roll rate to get the lift vector pointed back up before you end up with the nose way down here. Now you have to do one of them nose low recoveries. See? <laughs> uh, you know, you can, the good news is you can get them both done on the same maneuver. See? <laughs> but it's not ideal. All right? We really want, don't want that to happen. So the reason that 70 degree bullet's in there is say, you know, in these big guys, we've got to keep our lift vector up a little bit. We approach the horizon. So we don't have so far to go with it to get it turned up the rest of the way because of our roll rates. The other way of looking at that, I want to kind of get this clear, is you don't need to go to 70 degrees of bank. That's not what I'm saying. If you're at 45 degrees climb, then maybe you only need 45 degrees of bank, and that'll be enough, you see? But don't, don't go through the horizon like this, and these guys, it doesn't work. Thrust. Notice now comes thrust. What we're saying is roll first, then thrust. 
Do you see why? If you first roll the lift vector off and then thrust, thrust is good because it preserves energy. And on most nose high recoveries, you want to preserve all the energy you can. But if you roll and then thrust, that will not be counterproductive to getting the nose down. See why? Bullet number four has a whole bunch of nuances in it. It says as the aircraft symbol approaches the horizon. Well, that's the issue we just talked about. You've got to lead roll. You've got to lead the roll out in order to get the lift vector up in time. Okay. Then it says make a coordinated roll. And I have that word coordinated underlined. And the reason that I do is because I want to get it straight between us today what I mean by that. Because rightfully, there's a lot of different meanings for that word out there. Okay. But in everything we do today, when I say coordinated rudder, what I mean is that we will apply rudder in the direction we are trying to roll the plane. Left rudder, left roll. Right rudder, right roll. And just the amount of rudder that it takes to get the desired roll response. And these are very powerful rudders. It only takes smooth, small applications to get the desired result in most of our fleets. There is no time today we will use opposite rudder, none. Nothing we're going to do today involves opposite rudder. The only use I have for opposite rudder in these airplanes is, is, is uh, crosswind uh, landings and crosswind takeoffs. Okay? We will always be using coordinated rudder. It says make a coordinated roll to a wings level, slightly nose low attitude. You know what? This is the hardest thing of all for our airline pilots to do. It's fascinating to me to watch this. In other words, we want to recover wings level, slightly nose low. But you know what? As I watch all of our airline pilots, mostly Czech airmen, I'll see guys do this fantastic job, and gals, from the recovery process, they'll do a beautiful recovery. And they'll get the airplane just right here, and then they get here and they say, okay, that's it, I'm done, I'm an airline pilot, what I do now is I fly level. So they go straight to try and fly and level. They just haven't noticed one little thing. They're only going 80 knots. <laughs> So as they try to fly level at 1G, what goes out of limits? Angle of attack. Whirr, and off we go from one of those nose low recoveries. See? So rather than have that happen to us, we want to recover wings level slightly nose low. I'm talking 0 to 5 degrees, just slightly nose low every single time. If you do that, it is quite simple to fly this airplane at half a G. And if you're at half a G, it doesn't matter if you're going 80 knots. Does it? Not one bit. At 80 knots, at half a G, your alpha looks just like that. It's right in limits. Try to support 1G, whoo, out of limits. So in this nice, safe flight condition, we can look down then at our, and analyze our energy, our airspeed, and then adjust thrust and pitch as necessary and recover to level flight when we have the energy to do so. Are you okay on that? Stepping through that? Right. Let's move over now to uh, the nose low recovery procedure. Now, if you don't mind, before I start on these bullets, let me ask you to tell me, what is the first unseen, unwritten step? Autopilot and auto throttles off is always the first step. Okay. As we go through these bullets, starting with bullet number one, it says, roll the airplane in the shortest direction toward the sky pointer. That by itself will deal with many of these, just that bullet alone. In other words, let's take the airplane that looks like this. Okay, here he is. All right. And what that first bullet says is, we will roll the shortest direction toward the sky pointer. Well, as we roll toward the sky pointer, what's happening? We're putting the lift vector under the sky pointer, aren't we? And then we pull with the assurance we are pulling toward heaven. Say, simple enough, simple enough. But now let's go to bullet number two. It says, with the bank angle in excess of 90 degrees, and this is where the airline accident history goes right down the tubes. With bank angle in excess of 90 degrees, we must maintain neutral to forward yoke pressure. Well, neutral to forward is a big range, isn't it? Well, what do we mean by that? Well, I think, I think you know. Suppose your airplane looks like this. Here you are. Okay? 90 degrees of bank, nose low. 
Look like this. Well, this is where the neutral part comes, neutral. You're going to unload toward about zero G, quote, neutral, about zero G. And then back to bullet one, roll the shortest direction toward this guy pointer. What are we rolling with? We're rolling with yoke, with, with ailerons and spoilers, because we have no alpha on this plane. We roll toward the sky pointer, then we pull. OK. Now, how about if our airplane looks like this? This is where the forward part comes. Very unnatural for an airline pilot to do this. But you are going to have to take the yoke of your airplane. If you're anywhere near pattern airspeeds or altitudes, you are going to have to take the yoke of your airplane and move it smoothly but aggressively forward. I didn't know that. I did not know that. When I first started doing these things in the simulator, I buffooned it. Because, see, in my other life, in my hand, in my stick, I had the entire stabilizer of an airplane. I had pitch authority. I could ease forward, I could ease forward on that stick, that airplane, and I could go to one negative G flight and fly along inverted. And if I had some extra energy, I could go farther forward on the stick and go outside, you know how that feels. Okay. But what I didn't realize and hadn't thought a lot about is the airline, the airline transport planes that we fly, all I have in my hand is a little bitty elevator on the back of a great big stabilizer that is still trimmed to whatever airspeed I entered this mess in. Guys and gals, you don't have the pitch authority to fly inverted at or near pattern speeds, period. Period. You know what I'm saying? You can't get to one negative G with all the elevator you've got. So get it in. Because if you get it in, what's going to happen, and I'm talking about low altitudes, you know, pattern kind of speeds, anywhere in the pattern range. You get it all the way in, what you're going to do is you're going to get past zero probably, depending on where your stabilizer is trimmed to at the, this point. You're going to get past zero, but you're never going to get to negative one. What am I saying? With all of this in, your nose is still coming down. But it's coming down at a much slower rate, which is critical to success if the ground is here. OK? All right. By the way, think about this. If you're holding this thing full forward in this scenario, and your seat belts are loose, instead of pushing forward, you're going to end up coming right up out of the seat and coming back on the yoke which is why I think most of us put on our harnesses and our crotch strap coming through 18,000 so that we're in there to stay. You're holding full forward on the yoke, and even though you're holding full forward on the yoke, your nose is coming down, but it's coming down at a much reduced rate. Now, since we're holding full forward on the yoke, we've actually got a negative alpha on this airplane right now, but that's what's going to roll the plane is going to be yoke, ailerons and spoilers. So as we hold full forward, we roll the yoke, and which way? Back to bullet one, we roll toward the sky pointer. So we're holding full forward, and we're rolling toward the sky pointer. This is keeping our nose from dropping out. As we roll toward the sky pointer, notice that I get to this next one, which in yellow says, apply coordinated rudder. Well, why am I saying put in coordinated rudder, since I just said that rudder will not roll the plane at this alpha? But yet, I'm going to tell you to put your coordinated rudder fully in, fully, all of it, right now. Because as many of you know, the rudder in this portion of the roll becomes what aerobatic pilots call top rudder. It becomes the elevator of the airplane now. And these airplanes spend a lot of time in this portion of the roll. They don't roll that fast. So if you'll get your rudder fully in in the direction that you're rolling, it will keep the nose from dropping through. Because in this portion, there's nothing lifting. And if you don't put that rudder in, what's going to happen? When you get to this portion of the roll, she's going to slice out just like that. But if you got the rudder all the way in, it will hold the nose. Now, most fleet aircraft, the nose is, will still drop slightly, even though the rudder's all the way in. Depends on how fast you're going. Uh, but the rudder ratio kind of accommodates that, so at most speeds, you're still not going to be able to hold it. Okay? 
The MB-11, you MB-11 guys that are in here, you need to be aware you have the most powerful rudder on the planet. <laughs> it, 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 and you should know that. In your case, you actually don't need all the rudder. When I was doing this, I did this in all fleet aircraft, and in the MB-11, I found I could actually stop the nose drop. Have you guys ever seen an MB-11 rudder? It's this great big segmented barn door. It comes off the tail, and it goes all the way back to the nose. You seen anything? <laughs> it is unbelievable. So for you MB-11 guys, use the rudder, but use it judiciously because it is very effective on that airplane. You guys can actually hold your nose in this portion of the roll. I mean, you can control it. It won't come down at all. The rest of us, even with all the rudder in, it's going to be coming down somewhat, but, but at a very slow rate. Okay, now we get through to bullet number four, which says, with bank angles less than 60 degrees. So what's happening here? We're holding the yoke full forward. We're rolling. Right now, we got all the rudder in, too, don't we, in coordinated direction? We get in here, and when the bank angle comes to less than 60, what's coming up now? The lift vector, isn't it? So now we're going to go from pushing to pulling. And as we pull back, you won't believe what happens next because your left foot in this example is all the way deployed on the rudder. When you pull back, what goes up? Angle of attack. When angle of attack goes up, what rolls the plane? Rudder, exactly. And that rudder is all the way in. It'll whack. It'll try to snap roll. That's fine. Just neutralize the rudders real quick, okay? Because you want your lift vector up, don't you? And you want it up right now. But neutralize real quick or it'll go on by, okay? Okay, we got the lift vector up right now, and now we look like this, okay? Now we look like this. And then we come to the last step, which says, adjust thrust and utilize drag devices as required. As required for what? Yes, corner speed. For the first time, as we pull back, see the first four steps, what they're designed to do is minimize nose drop while we get the lift vector pointed up. That's what those first four steps do. And now I'm pulling out of this dive. And for the first time as I pull back toward either CL max or G limit, I look into my cockpit for what piece of information? Corner speed. And as I find myself below corner speed, as I pull, what will I do with my throttles? Max power. At or below corner, max power as I ride my stick shaker. If I find myself well above corner speed as I pull in my G limit, what do I do with the throttles? Idle. Those two actions will dramatically reduce the altitude lost and the resulting dive recovery. This yellow on the bottom says inverted, unload, and roll first, then pull. You will be hearing that from your simulator instructor repeatedly. You'll hear it in the briefing, you'll hear it in the sim, you'll hear it in the debriefing. The reason you're hearing it so much, guys and gals, is because the accident history on this is horrible. Airline pilots are doing this the other way around. Okay, what's that? Well, that's an MD-80 flat plate display. And uh, the reason it's in here is because I learned something. I learned a lot, actually, but this is another area where I learned something uh, that I hadn't thought much about before. I buffooned a couple of recoveries. Is, is I've done this for a lot of visiting firemen now in the simulator and all that sort of thing. And a couple, three times I embarrassed myself uh, by not getting my SA correct uh, for a recovery. And, but what I learned from those is this, and this applies to any flat plate display. Okay, it doesn't matter which airplane you're in, A300s, MD-11s, this just happens to be an MD-80. This is power on it. As you look around, this is the case of the unit with its indices. That is the fixed aircraft symbol. That essentially is part of the case. It's the case. It never moves. It is always in exactly that position. It's the airplane. You are strapped to that. If you can think that way and realize that the screen floats behind you, you've got it. If conceptually you can think that way, you will never wrong, roll a long way. You will never push when you should be pulling. With that concept in mind, what I'm going to do is flip up the next screen. I'm going to ask you to 
announce out loud after you ascertain your SA, should you be pushing or should you be pulling? And should you roll left or should you roll right to put your lift vector under the sky pointer? Ready, go. Yes, exactly, push and right. Because I think you will agree that if you clearly realize that this is the airplane, then is there any doubt that I need to push and that the shortest direction to get the lift vector under the sky pointer is to roll right. If you think like that, I promise in a simulator you'll never go the long way around and more importantly in the real world. To complete this unusual altitude recovery procedure segment of the Advanced Aircraft Maneuvering Program, I'd like to briefly review the proper use of rudder at high angles of attack. As I state in the aerodynamics segment, smooth application of small amounts of rudder coordinated with the aileron will significantly improve the roll response at high angles of attack. I'd like to re-emphasize that we have very large, powerful rudders on our aircraft. We do not want to introduce high side slip angles at high angles of attack by either kicking the rudder or applying the rudder in excess at high alpha. It only requires a small amount of smoothly applied coordinated rudder to achieve the desired result. This coordinated rudder will significantly improve the roll response at high angles of attack. Additionally, there is a lead lag relationship associated with using the rudders at high angles of attack. That is, you must wait a second or two to see and feel the results of the rudder application. A lack of understanding of this effect can lead to over-controlling the aircraft. The high angle of attack maneuvering demonstration that you will be doing in your fleet simulators will familiarize you with this effect. The pilot not flying should refrain from applying any pressures on the controls, pitch, roll, or rudder. I know all of our highly experienced pilots realize the added pressures on the controls can make it very difficult for the pilot flying to feel and fly the airplane properly. Clearly, two pilots on the controls could result in over-controlling. If the captain wants to take control of the airplane from the first officer, he should call out. I have the airplane. And the first officer should state, you have the airplane. This procedure will clearly define the transfer of control. In conclusion, let me reinforce that AAMP emphasizes keeping the aircraft inside its flight envelope at all times, regardless of attitude. Likewise, in your simulator training, you should never increase angle of attack above the onset of stick shaker alpha, that angle of attack that we know as CL max. I hope you'll find this video a useful review and that your simulator training will be both challenging and productive.